So it's the 2019 mid-year book freakout tag, late again as usual, but let's not belabor that fact and jump right into the questions. Question number one, the best book you read this year so far? There hasn't been any five-star reads this year, but a lot of overambitious fours, fours punching above their weight. But if I'm going to pick a favorite for this year, it is Korean-American author Angie Kim in her debut novel, Miracle Creek. The story about the isolation of immigrant parents and uh, parents of children with special needs, and all wrapped up in a courtroom drama, legal thriller, which I don't have a lot of experience with, but I really enjoyed how the lawyers in the story were able to sway opinion from one side to another through the use of narrative tricks and rhetoric. So, immigrant story and rhetorical spin seems awfully timely in this, the worst of all possible and darkest timelines in North America. Number two, best sequel you read in 2019. Now, I did read one sequel this year, but I'm going to need that book for a different prompt. So instead, I'm going to fudge things a little and offer up John Boyne's A Ladder to the Sky. It's not traditionally a sequel, but I imagine it exists in a larger John Boyne universe that encompasses the heart's invisible furies. It's sort of like the Marvel universe or the Fast and Furious universe. On a side note, I did recently see Hobbs and Shaw and I enjoyed it thoroughly. So all right, you've got this John Boyne universe with A Ladder to the Sky, which is, I consider, a light fictionalization of a real world uh, ladder climbing sociopath lacking any sort of empathy, Dan Mallory, otherwise known as AJ Finn. In A Ladder to the Sky, we're introduced to Maurice Swift, who will stop at nothing, step on any toes, crack a few eggs to gain authorial fame and fortune. And I mean, this is just released a year after Hearts Invisible Furies. Boyne is proving himself to be about as prolific as Stephen King. I was reminded of this book recently with another contentious author, James Frey, whose book A Million Little Pieces is getting the Hollywood treatment shortly as well. Number three, a new release that you haven't read yet, but want to. I don't know how it's even possible, being here on Booktube, that I have not read any of Colson Whitehead's oeuvre, other than his early account of him trying to play in the World Series of Poker, called The Noble Hustle. Fun fact, for that book, his poker trainer was one Helen Ellis, who wrote the fantastically funny short story collection American Housewife. Anyway, being here on Booktube, how is it that I've never read anything from Colson Whitehead, like The Underground Railroad, Saga Harbor, Zone One, or The Intuitionist? So I'm looking to rectify that shortly in the fall with The Nickel Boys. Number four, most anticipated release for the second half of the year, I'm going to say the Booker shortlisted Ducks, Newberry Port by Lucy Ellman. Now it's easy enough for me to say that, that I want to read that, but we'll see if my resolve holds until it is released here in Canada on September 10th. The reason being, it is the stream of consciousness thought of an Ohio uh, woman, middle-aged woman, baking in her kitchen, rambling on about different things on a single run-on sentence that goes for a thousand pages where every period has been replaced by the phrase, the fact that. So that fact that appears dozens of times on every page and over and over again, sort of being reduced to this background white noise. It seems like a bit of a daunting read and I'm not sure I'm going to have the resolve to get through it right now. I'm reading Neil Stevenson's Fall or Dodge in Hell, which is another 700 plus page uh, brick of a book. So we'll see if I have anything left by the time September 10th rolls around. Number five, biggest disappointment. This is where I needed the sequel from earlier, and it is Fight Club 2, written by Scott Polignac. I don't know why we needed this comic. I don't know what this comic is actually trying to achieve. It's all very meta with Chuck himself appearing in the comic. Anyway, I just, I didn't enjoy it at all. I was very disappointed. And frankly, if I can go off on a bit of a tangent, this is how I feel about comics in 2019. A lot of my favorites, Saga is on an extended hiatus. Black Monday Murders, which I really did enjoy, is also on hiatus as one of the co-creators is sick. Now, Brian Michael Bendis' uh, coming to DC has been mostly overwhelming. Tom King's promise on Batman has been mostly meh, and he's leaving the series early, and I can't even be bothered with Grant Morrison's run on Green Lantern. Now, Marvel seems to be willing to try some interesting things. You've got Frank Castle, the Punisher, who is now the Herald of Galactus and also a time-traveling Ghost Rider. Interesting. You've got the all-Asian cast of Agents of Atlas. 
not sure if I really care about that. And you've got this preponderance of old man stories. You've got old man Quill, old man Logan, and old man Hawkeye. Now, I will say that I'm very excited about Hickman's run on House of X. It's really showing a lot of promise with the first two issues. I hope he can pull it off. He really does set some staging, but uh, I don't know if he can actually bring it all together. And I'm really sad. Giant Days is coming to an end with the next issue. Every single one has been fantastic so far. And Paper Girls ended at issue 30, a great run that I really enjoyed. So tell me what I should be picking up. What should be on my pull list as far as comics go that uh, you've been enjoying? I'd appreciate that in the comments down below. Number six, big and surprise, this would be Young Hill Kang's East Goes West. Not only the big surprise that I enjoyed this book that was first published in 1937, this thing reads like it's always been part of the canon. I really did enjoy it, especially for its portrayal of uh, America at that time. But what is also super surprising is that I've never heard of Young Hill Kang before. Here it is, a contemporary who dined with Hemingway and Fitzgerald, who was published by famous Scribner editor Max Perkins and worked with Thomas Wolfe. And yet I have never heard of Young Hyo Kang before Penguin Classics released this as part of Asian Pacific Heritage Month. Anyway, it is well worth checking out. I hope you do get a chance to read this. Most people like myself, whose first introduction to Asian American literature was Amy Tan, who was published decades later. So yes, a bit of a surprise, this one. Number seven, favorite new author debut or new to you, and that is Sally Rooney. I am all aboard the hype train. I loved normal people. I can't wait to pick up conversations with friends. I've already taken the requisite book shot and posted to Instagram. I am all aboard, and I can't wait to see what else she puts out. I really did enjoy it. This was a four and a half star read for me, but man, some of you out there on BookTube just hate this book. Number eight, newest fictional crush. I don't know if this is a YA booktube type thing, so I'm at a bit of a loss book-wise, but I will say Amy, Molly, and Billy Lord as Gigi from Olivia Wilde's directorial debut in Booksmart. Man, I love that movie. And forget the Hunger Games or Harry Potter. I want the novelization of these girls' lives post high school. Although, essentially, that is what um, Giant Days is, except in a UK setting. Anyhow, Olivia Wilde directorial review made some incredibly smart decisions. This is still adhering to a teen genre type movie, but updated for our 2019. I thought this was a great flick, well worth checking out. Number nine, newest favorite character. Well, that would be Sadogo. Not only is he an Ogo, not to be confused with a giant, he hates that, but he's a Sadogo who spends most of Marlon James Black Leopard, Red Wolf, mumbling disconsolately to himself about the 171 killings he's performed. And honestly, I didn't really enjoy the book all that much. Despite all the hype, I probably wouldn't have finished it if it wasn't for the fact that it was part of our Discord read-along. I mean, it is filled with some purely nightmarish characters that are frightening as all get out. Um, and the rest of the characters are just so angry and petulant the entire time. It was nice to have Sadogo and, close second, the water buffalo, who really doesn't say anything at all, to strike up a different emotional tone. I was grateful for it for the book, and I'm grateful for Sadogo to help me through the entire reading. Number 10, book that made you cry. This would have to be A Place for Us, written by 20-year-old Fatima Farheen Mirza, and it joins Sally Rooney as another jaw-droppingly incredible read from someone so young. Now, while Sally Rooney is writing about a high school romance going into the first few years of college, uh, Fatima is writing about sibling relationships and the relationships between the parents and children, specifically fathers and sons, and how they can love each other but inevitably butt heads. And it's written with such a keen eye and so much maturity. It's just unbelievably well done. This is another four and a half star read for me. Now, this was our August Discord Book Club pick. It's also one of the finalists for the BookTube Prize, and I'm looking forward to talking about it in the future. But nearing the end, when we fall into the father's voice, it is just gutting. It was written so, so well. And I love these stories that examine faith in the face of modern life. And it's just told so wonderfully well. I'm looking forward to talking about this one a lot more. I really did, really did love this one. Number 11, books that made you happy. 
So, speaking of the BookTube Prize, I was asked to be a judge and suddenly got myself into a huge panic about having to read all of these books. And in the middle of it was Claire Fuller's Bitter Orange, which was this summery gothic novel that I loved. It's told from the point of view of protagonist Frangelico, which makes her sound like a boozy Batman villain along the lines of Edward Nigma, Harleen Quinzel, and Victor Fries. Now, this is one of those books that I never would have picked up on my own. It was flying completely under my bookish radar. So it was serendipitous that I was forced to read this as part of the BookTube prize. And it was this wonderful bright spot in my otherwise emo pearl clutching, hand wringing sort of uh, over the top extra uh, lament about having to read all these books for the BookTube prize. And all the books were so good. This was just my favorite of the batch. Number 12, most beautiful book you've read. I know I've already mentioned this book already, but I can't help it. It is Marlon James' Black Leopard, Red Wolf. This is a beautiful cover. It is the perfectly Instagrammable cover. Bold colors, big font, viewable at a thumbnail size. And maybe the book didn't really work for me, but you can't argue this is a standout cover in a year filled with bright and vibrant covers. Number 13, what book do you need to read before the end of the year? Now, a lot of the attention is being paid to a Booker Prize uh, long list. And of course, I do want to try and read Ducks Newberry Port by Lucy Ellman. But The Guardian is also running the Not the Booker Prize, and it features two books from a small independent UK press called Dead Ink. One of them is the unauthorized biography of Ezra Maz by Daniel James, which is sitting at an unprecedented 4.67 star rating over on Goodreads. This is something that I want to pick up if I can find it in Canada anywhere, and it's something I've added to my list to keep an eye out for if I can find it. So that is it for the late three-quarter year book freakout tag. Um, I'm going to have to check out seeing what other people have been doing as far as this tag goes. But that's it for me this week. I hope you have a great week of reading, and we'll talk to you soon.